So good morning, everyone. Uh, so welcome to join today's uh, uh, seminar about the energy optimized partial computation uh, of loading for delay sensitive applications in the regions and networks. So presented by Professor Ramon Chu Zhou. Um, this seminar is organized by the Electrical Power System Laboratory at the Electrical Engineering Department of the University of Iceland. Uh, so today we have a great uh, guest professor, uh, Meng Chu Zhou from University Institute of Technology. Uh, so Professor Meng Chu Zhou received his uh, bachelor degree in control engineering from Nanjing University of Science and Technology, uh, China, in 1983, uh, and a master degree in automatic control from Beijing Institute of Technology uh, in 1986, and PhD degree in computer and systems engineering from Minnesota Polytechnic Institute um, in 1990. He joined the new JC Institute of Technology in 1990 and is now distinguished professor in electrical and computer engineering. His research interests are in patrick nice, intelligent transportation, automation, cl cloud and edge computing, internet of things, big data, web services, and intelligent transportation. He has over 1,000 publications, including 13 books, over 700 journal papers, uh, with which is over 600 publications in IEEE transactions, uh, 30 patents, and 29 book chapters. Uh, he's the founding editor of IEEE Prize Book Series on Systems Science and Engineering, editor in chief of IEEE and CAA Journal of Automatica Sinica, and associate editor of IEEE Internet of Things Journal. IEEE transactions on intelligent transportation systems and IEEE transportations on transactions on systems, mine and cybernetics. Uh, he's a recipient of a Homo Research Award for U.S. senior scientists from Atlanta Wong Hongbo Foundation, Franklin Wong Taylor Memorial Award, and the Nobel Winner Award from IEEE Systems Mine and Cybernetics Society. Excellency in Research Prize and the Medal from NJIT, an Edison Patent Award from the Research and Development Council of New Jersey. He is a highly cited scholar with over 50,300 Google Scholar citations, and the H index is 113. He is a fellow at IEEE, an International Federation of, Federation of Automatic Control. Uh, American Association, Association for the Advancement of Science, Chinese Association, Association of Automation, and the National Academy of Inventors. So uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to have uh, Professor Joe here. And um, uh, let's welcome. Uh, he gave us a very great talk about this issue. Please, Thank you very much. And that is all for the very long. Uh, introduction to me. <laughs> well, I want to make a quick note uh, that, uh, you know, New Jersey Institute of Technology is uh, next to New York City. My school is 15 minutes away from the Newark Airport. Many flights will go through Newark Airport. In fact, flying Newark Airport to here only like five hours. From here over there, six hours around. Yeah. I told my friends, if you have three hour, you know, ex uh, ex transition time in New York airport, I can go there to pick you up and, uh, you know, go to a nice dinner or play me with some tennis, then I can send you back because we're so nearby. <laughs> so remember this, okay, very, very nearby. It's only like 30 minutes from my house as well. And my school offers like, you know, excellent facility, gym, Tennis, whatever you you know, soccer if you want, we can do something there. <laughs> yeah, tennis and so I play tennis a lot, you know. Every basically, I play tennis every other day. 
Now, Great. that's an excellent location, so because many European flights will go to Newark or JFK. But JFK is very difficult for us because JFK, you need to go through the New York City downtown. The time is not controllable. So uh, we don't, don't recommend you to go to JFK. I cannot do anything with JFK. <laughs> Five hours, six hours, no use to me. But, but the you know, distance not that far, but any time could be jammed on highway, local, you know, if you go to JFK. We have three airports there, in fact. Newark Airport is the most convenient one. Then JFK is the probably largest one. Then we have LaGuardia, small, smaller airport in New York City. So, you know, remember that. If you want me to treat you well, go to Newark Airport <laughs> first. Do <laughs> remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once I transferred in the uh, JFK Airport, and yeah. there's a super long queue for waiting. In crazy, line. crazy. Everything, long, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that I picked up a guest from Hong Kong. He landed there like, uh, you know, like 10 o'clock in the evening till like one o'clock in the morning, I get, get him out. So really, you know, terrible, terrible experience. <laughs> Plus, uh, you know, you know, traveling between New York, New York City and New Jersey is always tough because there's, there, there are bridges or tunnels, you know, they are always busy. <laughs> now, my, think of the yeah, 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 yeah. Now, uh, another point I want to, uh, in a brief to you is that uh, NJIT is the top school nationally in student economic upward mobility by Journal of Code of Forbes. This really means to, uh, students pay the tuition. Then when they graduate, they got a salary. The salary divided by the tu tuition is top one. So <laughs> most economic. <laughs> so the, payback is quite yeah, the, the number one in US. <laughs> and the reason that NJIT has mostly engineering school and uh, the engineering students got high pay. The, plus, this is a public university, so tuition is not that expensive, like half of the Columbia University's tuition in a private uh, school. Tuition much higher. Yeah, That's yes. the reason. The MIT is private, so their tuition is much very high. Although their you know average pay will be higher than in Japanese students, but uh, you know you, once you divide the uh, that yeah. by bigger yeah. number, then that uh, upward uh, so-called upward mobility is, uh, is lower. Right? So you have a higher graduate salary to tuition fee ratio. Yes, compared with the other private institutes. Of course, absolutely, yeah. Like MIT so or Caltech. It's a more costly option. For yeah, 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 yeah. Cost That's effective, good. we call it. Cost effective, right? Cost effective. Yeah. Most cost effective, yeah. Now, before I go to the uh, my talk, in fact, I want to introduce to you uh, my I2P Press Wiley book series on system science and engineering. Uh, I launched uh, about uh, now 10 years ago almost. Oh, not sharing? Interesting. I thought I already shared share them min minutes ago. Uh, sharing now? Mm. Is, is it working? Okay, okay. Okay, right? Okay, sorry. <clears throat> so, uh, so, uh, this series, of course, covers uh, many titles, published already many titles, in you know, like machine learning, machine learning uh, control. Uh, you know, uh, so if you these are the titles you can you can you can see in you know, robotics, uh, uh, some power system as well. In fact, number fifteen is energy cons conservation in residential, commercial, and industrial facilities. And of course, uh, you know, nonlinear systems, uh, scheduling, and uh, recently, of course, we have for intelligent manufacturing and industry 4.1, human robot interaction control. I'm going to have one book is about uh, uh, sustainable manufacturing systems to be, to 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 be, to appear in in fact in my in probably two or three months. And the scope of course really mostly you know those complex systems, smart systems, smart grid, 
supply chain, etc. So if you have any you know, good ideas or you want to write a book, consider my book series. I will be happy to offer you a pro proposal sample, etc. It will go through a review process, but uh, it's e e easy. That's great. Which uh, book series? This book series is called uh, I2P uh, Wiley Book Series on System Science and Engineering. I might need to change the title to like uh, uh, intelligent cyber physical systems because they think this title is a little bit too old. <laughs> so probably starting next year, I'm going to have a new title's name. Yeah. Okay. So you are, you are the editor of this. Uh, yes. So uh, normally the book proposal will come to me first. Then I'll, I'll give you some comments. Then you revise it. Then the publisher is going to ask reviewers to review your book. Normally, you need to suggest some reviewers, so those suggested reviewers will be invited. So it's not that difficult. The publisher is really right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Will is quite famous in USA. I'm not sure whether in Europe now. <laughs> okay, now let me uh, also introduce to you my journal, IGBCA Journal of Automatic Cynical. This journal is the first journal I2P collaborated with an organization outside the USA. CAA means the Chinese Association of Automation, the huge organization in China. Because in China, we have a so-called department or school of automation. So every university has this department or this school. Automation is very popular and also has uh, normally collect uh, many, many smart students because uh, people think automation in the future, right? <laughs> and uh, this journal now has the impact factor 7.847, that's 7 out of 65 automation control system journals. And uh, if uh, its site score is 13, that's in one category is a top top uh, top journal in control and auto optimization in that category is top top and then you know f number 14 in control and systems engineering number 16 in information systems and num number 20 in artificial intelligence so it's like top uh, t 5 to 10 uh, percent kind of journals. So it's, it's, it, we have really excellent uh, papers every year. Authorships uh, everywhere in the world. I, I haven't uh, noticed any papers from your university. Probably next time I welcome your submission. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Also, like, like digital, digital twins, <laughs> power <laughs> yeah, power systems, systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, in fact, in fact my uh, own power uh, system dispatch kind of problems uh, paper was published in this journal uh -huh. <laughs> many, before I become <laughs> editor in chief. <laughs> yeah, 2018, I became editor in chief in 2019. And we also have two excellent, uh, you know, awards called uh, uh, Xue Shen Qin Paper Best Paper Award and the Nobel Winner Review uh, Best Review Paper Award. The first, uh, well, Xue Shen Qin, uh, Qin well, in fact, I, I don't know, foreigners may not know, like you people don't know, but the Chinese are all know, Qin Xue Shen. He, he was, uh, um, he was with Caltech doing the, you know, missile control kind of things. So he went back to China. So at that time, I think uh, U.S. military people is really unhappy with that because they think this guy is equivalent to like a two, uh, uh, like four bat, bat I don't know. I don't know. Yes. What's the yeah, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's very large, very large, large, large you know, yeah. troops. Many troops oh, were equipped. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm very curious who made that estimation. Uh, the one, the one general in the US. Yeah, in general. Uh -huh. They tell the president's office, so, look, this guy is equivalent yeah. to like 2,000 people, army people, right? So we cannot let him go back to China right? because basically, uh, so he was considered like a father of a control engineer in China. 
yeah, yeah, very famous guy. In fact, yeah. he has. And it's very yeah. sad to see that at that time politics yeah. interfere with science research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah a lot like, of good scientists. Uh, yeah, uh, they. I think practice. they they couldn't let him move to back to China for at least a year. What, 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 is, what year was it about? I think it's around the 50s. Oh, the 50s. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this, uh, this, uh, this uh, guy, very famous in China. So every Chinese student, in particular, in automation field. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Nobel winner is the MIT professor. He's the father of cybernetics. The, the word cybernetics is created by him. Yes, yes. And we normally, you know, Pick a past paper from the past three years you know, published in our journal, right? So, for for example, this year we are going to pick a paper from 2019 to 2021. Yeah, because among these three years, we pick up the paper to be awarded in 2020. So each award is awarded like every three years. No, no, every year. Every year. But every we year. pick a paper from the past, the past years. years. Yeah. Okay, okay. The, the reason is that we want to show whether the paper has impact, good contributions in terms, then whether it, it has good citation numbers. Uh, if it, it gets cited widely, then we think the paper might have good contributions. Uh, so that's really. And we put a lot of money, 20K. RMB really is equivalent to three thousand US dollars. I don't know how much money equivalent here. <laughs> you have your own money system, right? Uh, that would be yeah, a great number. <laughs> number. Yeah. Wow. Yes, yeah. So I told them this is definitely higher than those IGP chances best paper because I I know I got like a thousand dollars only for best paper in IGP chance IGP transactions. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, we welcome your excellent yeah. paper if you have so to con to come to this journal. I'm currently doing a few special issues. Uh, I actually robotic automation magazine asked me to you know uh, guest edit a special issue. Then I propose this machine learning for industry 4.0. Right? So that's uh, deadlines in October. Another one is the uh, human cyber physical system for intelligent manufacturing. That's for IGP chance on automation science and engineering. Deadline is November 30. If you, you have interest, of course, I will send you more detail. And this is, of course, a big data related uh, uh, special issue for IGP chance on computational social systems. Uh, so that's uh, again October 30. And I'm, I'm one of the Co guest ideas. I'm not the leading one. The first two are leading one. Now, this one is particularly about a sensor journal. This is open access journal, by the way. If you have a good paper, I might be able to get a fee waiver for you. Let me know, but you need to let me know. I have the, I'm the leading guest editor. So, this is, a, you know, any sensing related work for possibly for like intelligent monitoring, control and optimization in industry 4.0. Okay, so if you have anything, you know, uh, I would be happy to, not uh, happy to handle it. That this kind of open access journal has the one feature I really feel very impressed, in, 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 impressed. Number one, fairly fast turnaround time. Normally two weeks, three weeks, you get the result, good, bad. If uh, they ask you to do major revision. They will. They wish you to finish major revision within two weeks. Then within one week, we will give you the revision. And once it's accepted, within two days, the paper is out. It's online, published. <laughs> so it's really fast. So some of my papers published there, like uh, spending only like uh, one one month or one and a half month at the most. Yeah, because yeah, sometimes, sometimes really fast. very very fast, extremely fast. Yeah. 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 The most. Yeah. 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 The, the, that, a few other so like RGB sensors journal is also pretty fast, but not as fast as this time. This time yeah. one. Yeah. 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 They yeah. are. They are. They are doing good job too. I'm, I'm also active, active in RGB 
uh, Internet of Things journal. It's also fast, but the, uh, compared with this, is no, not that fast. <laughs> so this open access journal really has the edge in terms of the publishing papers in the country, very fast. Who is the pub? Uh, the publisher of this? Uh, this uh, publisher is uh, so called ND. PI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They have many, many open access journals. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I know that because they sometimes ask me to publish paper without any fee. So sometimes say, okay, that's fine. Yeah, some of my students want to have a journal paper, then you know, it's an easy one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, now I, you know, if you have any question, of course, let me know. Now I will go to my, you know, uh, Technical part. <laughs> I'm going to have uh, six uh, parts: introduction, motivation, how, what's the problem we are going to solve, and uh, what's the methodology we develop, and the performance evaluation, and then summary. So uh, basically, we are facing the environment uh, with uh, many mobile devices like uh, cell phone, you know, i iWatch, or wearable devices, etc. And uh, we have smart home, you know, smart uh, vehicles, internet vehicles, all these things involving uh, so-called mobile devices, right? And in these mobile devices, of course, they have to learn many tasks. Some are require, some require real-time responses, some are not, right? So uh, for those computation-intensive applications, Sometimes you can offload some part of the jobs to the agencies in order to improve the performance. Otherwise, you cannot really, you are going to exhaust your resources very fast. Memory, CPU, battery power, etc. Without, uh, you know, like uh, uh, off, uh, offloading some tasks to edge servers. So uh, some 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 applications are basically very difficult or very time consuming like environmental monitoring natural language processing augmented reality online games there they could be very computation demanding so it's just impossible to learn all those apps applications in your mobile devices so that's why we come up with the idea of mobile edge computing so mobile edge computing basically involves uh, you know, like uh, my macro base stations and then small base stations. Small base station will be very close to you, like uh, this building has a small uh, base station. The entire campus maybe have a macro base station, right? And all these uh, space stations will have a, a kind of much more powerful compute, com computing facility. They can handle a lot of uh, jobs. And we are talking about a partial computation offloading really means some part of the tasks should be offloaded to those edge servers to over you know, to improve overall uh, your you know, user experience. So we use a so-called user experience really means that we want uh, really fast responses from the systems, right? So apparently in order to do that, you need to really look for nearby servers and you need to have good, uh, you know, bandwidth access. You know, I mean, wireless cell, you know, wireless communication. You need to be fast enough. If you have bad Wi-Fi wi communication system, forget it. It's not going to work, right? And of course, you will involve some you know, overhead and cost in terms of communication, in particular, because you need to pass data a lot. And normally. Um, uh, the data come back to the uh, device is very small, so that's not a big deal. But uh, sometimes data go to the system maybe a little bit more, you know, time consuming. So, and, yeah. I have a question for the previous slide, if yeah. you go back. Yeah. Uh, so we have both macro base stations, yeah. MBSS, and yeah. also small base stations. Yeah. I'm wondering how you define which well, and what is the criteria of small and macro in well, terms of in the... many uh, small uh, uh, base station covers this much smaller field. Okay. Okay. And also, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, okay. coverage, wireless coverage, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Macro one or bigger. Right? Okay. So basically, macro one or 
cover at least uh, you know or small base, base station covers. Yeah. I see. Yeah. 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 In, uh, in general, in this kind of scenario, uh, we when we say macro base station, normally there could be really linked to those cloud data centers. It's much more powerful, you know, computing capability. And but the uh, the AG service we are talking about, uh, you know, in this particular work is associated with small base station. Okay. And in some of the research, of course, we in some of, if including some of my own research, we consider cloud data center and edge servers and your devices. Yeah, because sometimes if you are really dealing with big data applications, you have to deploy, you have to, you have to use the resources in cloud data centers, not uh, you know, even edge servers, right? That's, that, that's, that's, yeah, we have so some. We are talking about the edge servers. Mm -hmm. We are referring to the small base stations yes. or micro base. Yeah, uh, it's small, small base station, really near you. Okay. In, in other words, your task here will be yeah, yeah, the tower in this building, not that you're in the entire university building. Okay. Right? That is the only point here. So small base station would be within the building or something like that? Could be within the building, exactly. Micro would be several buildings. Somewhere yes, somewhere. yes, okay. yes. That's a good good understanding. Yeah, yeah. Campus wide, you need to yeah, use a macro. But uh, building wise, you use small. Yes. But of course, if you have very complicated building, within the building, you might have multiple small base station. Yeah, that's the architecture. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now let me show you this uh, short video from NTT, you know, to see how industrial people, exp you know, I I explain this uh, age computing. Uh, now I need to put it sound. In the future, various information and things will be connected to networks, and we expect it will be. People can now live more convenient and comfortable lives. And with things coordinated together and coordinated with information, it's expected that even more value will be created. At NTT, we're always leading this field. And by staying one step ahead, we will usher in a future that provides new value for everyone. When various information and things are connected to networks, it's referred to as the Internet of Things, or IOT. And huge, varied, and incomplete data generated by IOT need to be processed and responded to in a very short time. Today, the cloud has become an indispensable part of that process. However, the cloud that's been centrally deployed on a global scale needs to process an enormous amount of data. In addition, as the physical distance between the user and the cloud increases, transmission latency increases with it, increasing response time and stressing out the user. On top of that, the processing speed in this environment is largely dependent on the performance of the user's device. The solution to these problems is the edge computing platform. The edge computing platform works by allowing some application processing to be performed by a small edge server positioned between the cloud and user and crucially in a location physically closer to the user. This allows for some of the workload to be offloaded from the cloud or user's device at a location closer to the user for processing, while speeding up applications that require a low latency response. A good example of an application is a web browser. Web browsers are currently one of the most widespread applications in use by businesses and private users. 
According to a cabinet office survey, when PC users were asked what they were doing on their PC, 95% responded that they were using the internet. When asked for what, responses included watching videos, research, and downloading data. Things done in a web browser. And in recent years, web browsers have been operating on more and more devices, from set-top boxes and stick PCs to digital signage displays. Yet the usability and display speed of a web browser is heavily dependent on the device's performance. And if it's not up to the task, the wait can be stressful. So, to reduce that stress, NTT has developed a web browser that offloads part of the workload to an edge server. Using a stick PC, let's compare the display speed of a standard web browser with a new one developed by NTT. As you can see, websites with complex processing like JavaScripts and websites with lots of images in particular load faster in NTT's newly developed browser. And because the web browser's processing is now being performed on the edge server rather than the device itself, the device's performance mostly becomes irrelevant, allowing support for a wide range of devices. In the near future, various information and things will be connected to networks and they will collaborate with each other without us being conscious of them at all. NTT will be at the forefront of this transformation using the edge computing platform to create new applications and provide new value and a richer lifestyle for everyone. Yeah, so that's really uh, that's one of the you know applications related to uh, web browser. And in my um, other projects, we also use the the edge computing for uh, Industry 4.0, in the, like in particular in you know, semiconductor manufacturing environment. Over there, you know, we are we are using. Uh, AG servers to handle a lot of uh, imaging processing tasks, video processing tasks to make sure we can, you know, in a kind of uh, timely manner to find any issues with the pro uh, manufacturing processes to offer the real time control back to the system. Oh, I don't know if it's working. Oh. Okay. Let me see. Is still Shares. sharing, right? Is sharing or no? No, no, it's not. Oh, interesting. Teams, teams. Okay, I need to share again. Huh? Okay, good. Is sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Oh, oh, oh. I need to get this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to mute myself. So that. Okay. Yes, I, I, I seem to turn off the sound now. It's okay, right? Can you hear me? Yeah. So now I will talk about uh, the motivation part. So here I try to, uh, you know, the motivation part where, you know, we can, or for all those devices, we can, let me see how it's not muting. Yeah. Okay, nice, it should be okay. 
Hopefully it's okay. Now, uh, all those uh, uh, servers, they, they have the facility, they have the mechanism to adjust their like uh, CPU speed, depending or well, lower speed, uh, CPU speed means uh, lower energy consumption, right? And uh, so if the job uh, is not big, they will use lower speed to process it. Of course, they want to make sure they can finish by the time, right? They can reduce the frequency. Exactly. So that's one technology that has been utilized by you know, all those cloud data uh, centers and all as well as servers to, to make sure you don't uh, overuse the power, right? And also sometimes you want, uh, in, in, in the data center case, they, in fact, they will turn off some physical servers. If during deep night, no job, they are going to turn, turn off many. So they servers. completely turn off. So yeah, yeah, yeah. They only keep a few servers. Mm -hmm. So to because in, in, yeah, in one of my other research, we try to predict the workload to you know a cloud center, right? Okay. So really, depending on the workload, if workload peaks, you really need to prepare all the servers. You start to in down. The workload becomes smaller and smaller. You can start to turn off the servers. That's that's you know also very interesting research because really depending upon your accuracy of predicting the workload to come into server, right? Yeah, that's very important. Yeah, I'm wondering this shutdown and the startup of the servers. Overhead, we have to consider some yes, time. Yes, yeah, right? we have to consider that over uh, overhead. It's, uh, because uh, turning on and off costs yeah. money. And it's uh, very, uh, very similar as the operations of generators yeah. in power system. Yeah. When, you turn, when you shut down your generators and start it up, yeah. there are a very large amount of costs yes. for the starting up because of the fuel yeah. or, yeah. or other fuels. Yeah. And so we really need to consider this cost in the exactly. optimization. Exactly. So it's, it's a similar. Uh, the server shut down. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. See. Exactly. They could uh, lead to same mathematical formulation. So some of the optimization methods could be immediately applied in that. Yeah. So we want to really here minimize the total energy consumptions of both mobile devices and edge servers. Right. So then you know you the, the, so of course. It, in order to do that, you need to do so-called partial computation offloading by determining offloading ratio of tasks. How much, how many tasks should be offloaded to servers, right? And so you, you need to decide that a loc a location in kind of ratio. Now also you need to deal with the bandwidth allocation of available channels because if all devices want to communicate with servers, then you have the bandwidth, the sharing issue, right? And then you need to decide the CPU speeds of not only servers, but also mobile devices. If you're using macro base stations server, you need to also consider that, right? So, and uh, then trans transmission power of um, uh, mobile devices because uh, wireless transmission takes time. Okay, so transmission power must be considered. So you 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 all have these are really the kind of decision variables you want to de decide when you when you are given a particular scenario, right? And uh, we try to formulate this. We have formulated this problem as a kind of a mathematical programming problem, and uh, because it's like integer programming programs pr problem. So it's really empty hard. It means you, you know, as the size becomes larger, your analytical analytical solution is just impossible. Yes, I'm wondering in the all the decision variables, which variables are continuous, which variables are integral variables. Uh, so for example, offloading ratio is a kind of a continuous variable, could be approximate as a continuous variable. And then uh, CPU speeds is discrete because uh, you, you cannot have continuous, uh, you, you have levels. CPU speeds. Yes, several levels. Yeah, so only speeds. levels. Yeah, yeah. So bandwidth allocation could be kind of a continuous variable, right? 
and the transmission power is continuous running. So what's a problem? Well, basically, problem definition is really based on this kind of, uh, you know, scenario. You have uh, edge servers, you have uh, many devices, and uh, these servers are associated with, uh, you know, uh, uh, both uh, small station and uh, the uh, MBS, uh, macro base station. Macro base station server has more, much more powerful than your edge servers, right? So that's really the scenario as shown here in this slide. The NEC servers in this world. I mean, it's uh, AG servers associated with small business, uh, small base station. Okay. Okay. We, they are all called NEC servers because they are all associated with your uh, local uh, wireless communication devices. Now, if you associate, you, you, if you, in this particular scenario, we don't consider any cloud data center. Now, if you, cloud, you, you, if you consider a cloud data center, basically you have the uh, fairly powerful communication between your, you know, say for example, micro base station with the data, set, data center, much more remote <laughs> in general, okay. But uh, like uh, in one of my other research, we found that, uh, you know, like uh, Google, they have about uh, say a hundred data centers, right? They are really geographically located very far away. Plus those big data centers normally uh, need to utilize the environment environmental, like for example, the big reservoir. Why they they build up their big data center in the big reservoir? Because the reservoir's water can cool down the facility, right? So, but that uh, facility could be very far away from big cities like New York City, right? So the communication distance is much far, farther away. So, you know, you have to consider those kind of issues. Indeed. And also uh, another issue is, of course, it's related to your research, renewable energy utilization, right? So they want to have the geographically located, uh, you know, data centers such that they can well utilize renewable energy. So they put these data centers close to the size of the renewable exactly. energy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Either, so you can imagine either using, you know, like big reservoir because the big reservoir will, they will generate the electricity and the cooling the, the system as well. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's why like in China, they put uh, those uh, big data centers in Yunnan, we do those places. Yeah, yeah, the Apple data center <laughs> yeah, can go there, yeah, see yeah. Yeah. yeah, they have a strategic, you know, because the environment will really offer them good uh, you know, benefit. Also, they, like, they want to, they, they, they would love to have the data center in like a northern part of the Europe because the colder weather will help them cool down the data center. Yeah, we have a lot of data centers actually in yeah. Iceland. Yeah. yeah, of course, yeah. definitely, because you have the advantages here <laughs> in terms of weather. Yeah, <laughs> taking advantage of the yeah. weather here yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's really uh, uses natural cooling yes. for the data center. Yes, you're windy. You're so windy. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. So now we formulated this as a constrained mixed integer nonlinear program. Okay. Uh, so once you have e a integer, once it's nonlinear, the, its analytical solutions just become impossible, or, or we call it exact solution, it's because it's too complicated, and uh, uh, you cannot really solve them within say an hour or even within days. So you just give it up. So I'm going to let I introduce why we use intelligent optimization methods. Now here, of course, we have uh, so many decision variables as I explained, and also. We simply utilize the penalty to ensure we uh, satisfy all the constraints. You know, that's one of the, you know, fairly easy way to hand, to convert constrained problem into a non-constrained problem by adding a penalty. So if we, any constraint is violated, the object function will become so big, you will not 
use that as a solution. Okay, that's the way to, you know, that's one easy way to convert a constrained one into a non-constrained one. Once you have a non-constrained one, then we, and well, I, yeah, before that, I, in fact, we have to have this constraint. Constraints basically classified into two classes, inequality constraints and e equality constraints. Yeah. Inequality con constraints really means like uh, given a task, you know, what's the maximum that, uh, time you allow for us to finish? So maximum latency constraint. And then you have the maximum like a transmission power of your each each device. You know, what's what's uh, because the more power you transmit faster, right? And uh, maximum amount of energy in each device, maximum number of CPU cycles, also maximum number of amount of like memory, right? Memory. They, these are all inequality because you must be below that kind of. You know, capacity, right? Then you have for equality constraints. So, for example, each MD is uh, connected to a single edge server. Right? You, you will, that will be kind of zero one you know, integer. And uh, tasks uh, in from mobile devices must be executed in either itself or edge, small edge server or big edge server, basically, that's another constraint. And, uh, you know, they, sh they share the bandwidth, so that's the, you know, all, all them adding together should equal to, you know, the same bandwidth of all the channels. So, so these are all the constraints we have to handle. And of course, you know, most, uh, Optimization partners do you know, have object functions and constraints. Object functions could be multiple. Then you have for multi-objective for optimization problems. But in this particular work, we are dealing with single object because we are, we are looking at the how to minimize the total energy consumption among all devices, right? I'm wondering how many variables and how many constraints you have for a general skill optimization program for this uh, application? Uh, we have uh, uh, about, uh, uh, well, depending upon how many device, mobile yeah, devices yeah, you are dealing. So yeah. depending that and So we are, we are dealing with like, you know, from several hundreds to several thousands. I see, I see, I see. Really depending upon how, how many users you are dealing with. Because each user requires, requires many multiple variables. So yeah, you can imagine. Yeah, if five, if five, five, say, a hundred such devices, you know, if each device requires like five variables, design variables, you have 500 uh, dimension part. Then number of users, if you would like, you know, a thousand, then you can have five thousand. Oh, so, yeah. so, so problem size becomes larger. And larger. Yeah, that's very, a very big, a large scale. Yeah. Optimization program. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. So now, why we use the so so called intelligent optimization problem? The reason is that uh, the good thing is that uh, you know with intelligent optimization, you know, solution, at any time you are going to have a locally best solution. In the in other words, among all the solutions I have explored, I know this one is the best. So at any time they can offer at least a feasible good solution. Apparently it's, it's not a guarantee. It's, it, it, you know, if, we, if you have more time to learn, the evolution algorithm will try to find better, better and better and better solution in general, right? So it's a the, the global team. Global, global is global impossible. In, is a global, global, you cannot guarantee global mm -hmm. optimal, uh, global solution, globally optimal solution. Okay. But any time that they can guarantee you a very good solution. Now, if you use the exact uh, solution method like a, a CPLAX, IBM CPLAX, they may not be able to give you any solution after a, a couple of hours. That's not good. Yeah, it takes a very long time to solve. Now here, what we are talking about, we are talking about like one minute or two minutes, you have to give a solution. You cannot really. Beyond that number, I 
so that we have very constrained time in terms of the you know computing. Mm -hmm. That this is very critical short. for yes. industrial applications. For all the applications, you know, mobile device, you know, you cannot wait for a minute or more than a minute to do to get something, right? So you, you, real time response is so important that therefore, you know, this kind of so called intelligent optimization methods are the way to go, right? Because at least they can offer the solution anytime you want. And if you give, if you have more time to do computing, they can give you better and better solution. That's really the idea. Now, but among those intelligent, uh, you know, uh, algorithms, we have many ones. These, again, they could uh, have different uh, properties, different features. And the, the, the most uh, difficult part is that uh, these uh, intelligent optimization problems could be problem dependent. In other words, this type of you know, algorithms May very may work very well for this type of problems, but but it may fail in the other types, right? So that's why I told my students: if you are doing like a machine learning algorithm or intelligent optimization field, you always have jobs because you cannot find a universally applicable best algorithm for every problem. Right? That's uh, <laughs> that's the point. So you have developed. Uh... You know, tune the parameters for the like the generic algorithm GA or PSO yeah. for different applications, yeah. and I think that's um, very interesting because each uh, application, each uh, let's say engineer or scientist for building these applications using this uh, smart or heuristic uh, solution algorithms, yeah. they have to gain a lot of experience yeah. in yeah. solving a specific specific problem. Yeah. In order to, you know, this is a very yeah. and this is a very interesting compared yeah. with generally deterministic uh, yes. solution algorithms, yes. where a universal model or universal algorithm can work. Yeah. You don't need to tune a lot of parameters. Yeah. Yeah. Say, so of course, the, yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> in in actual like applications, you know, one one of my research is uh, uh, to like, for example, estimate the missing values in huge matrix, right? So in, in some of my recent work, we try to self-adaptively decide those parameters. Because otherwise, those intelligent algorithms have so many parameters to, to adjust. It's a terrible experience. So we want to use the you know, kind of uh, self-adaptive mechanism to adjust their parameters, so make them as few parameters as possible. That's a, in a very interesting you know, reaction to go. Yeah, I'm wondering how many parameters you need to tune in using this self-adapting methods. In this, much nice yeah, in this in particular, in this the, particular, uh, in this particular work, we have about uh, like uh, five, seven parameters. Okay. Not too, not too bad. But uh, you know, still you you are if you if possible, we want uh, either either pick up an algorithm without any such parameters or make them self-adaptive. Yeah, that is a perfect uh, case. Yeah, yeah. we have some work in that area. Probably next time I visit you, I can talk about that direction. <laughs> but in this particular case, we have considered a generic algorithm. This generic algorithm has its kind of uh, feature like a highly diverse solutions could be generated. That's important in this kind of you know, uh, scenario. But their convergence is very, very slow. Now, another one is the particle swarm optimization. They have very quick convergence, but they could easily uh, trapped into a local optimum. Okay, so now, of course, we can combine them, so we produce PGL. Uh, I, I will skip this because of time consideration. Uh, this really answers use in a, a video about uh, why we use swarm intelligence. Uh, so I will really come to this uh, idea here. 
PSO based on genetic genetic learning. So here we initial initialize the solutions at the first step. Then we initialize the parameter of both the genetic algorithm and the PSA. Then we start to perform genetic algorithms, crossover mutation and selection on superior particles. Now we use those good superior particles to update PSOs, you know, particles, position and velocities. Then we calculate the fitness value of each particle. Then we update the, you know, best uh, solutions. Now then we check whether the communication uh, termination conditions met or not. If if time's up, you produce your solution, whatever the solution you got, right? And uh, of course, this is uh, you cannot guarantee global optimal uh, solution, but uh, the so-called global optimal position here, I really want to mean so far the best one we have found. But that's really the idea. And this page, of course, shows the how to convert the uh, constrained one into unconstrained one. So that's the notation we use. Basically, you know, it's it's really easy because you have the uh, uh, inequality one and uh, equality one. So that's really the scenario here. We need to always uh, transfer. Uh, Transform a uh, constraint optimization to an unconstrained optimization in order to use uh, GA or PSO uh, articles, articles. No, no. Then there's no. In fact, there are multiple uh, ways, of, ways to handle constraints. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is one way. This is the okay. easiest way to handle them. Okay. But we do have additional ways to handle constraints. Yeah. Yeah. I can share you some papers if you 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 want to know. And we come to the performance evaluation scenario. Of course, you have to compare your approach with uh, or other approaches, right? And uh, so, uh, in, in particular, uh, we want to compare, like for example, energy consumption uh, among different, uh, you know, situations. And uh, I want to really show you the most important one is the this part. The, uh, the benchmark strategies. So what's the, you know, what's the, what's there in the field? Full offloading, that's the one approach. You know, so whatever tests you have, you go to share, you go to those uh, uh, HD servers, right? And uh, uh, here you can deal with, with uh, you know, with or without small base stations. No, it's just it, it, that's one poss possibility. And the second one is the full offloading to SBS, means you just uh, utilize a small servers without using macro servers. And then you have partial offload. Partial offloading, of course, you can, you know, you need to have a different, uh, you know, strategies. You could, uh, because you can, Associate users with a fixed uh, server or flexible, you know, servers. You, you still have, a, you can ha have a lot of variations in these awards, right? And then you will consider offload your tasks tasks to both small base small base station and macro base station, right? Depending upon scenario. So we have uh, multiple uh, scenarios, and you can compare them uh, with also, you know. Um, yeah, you can use, uh, if you will compare these kind of uh, scenarios, you'll find that uh, our solution offers the best uh, results. The solution is the lowest, lowest the energy consumption, that's PGL, right? And uh, in this graph, the legend for IFOS is uh, full, full Yeah, full overload into the uh, macro. So basically, it's, it's FOS, yeah. okay. FOM, FOS, PO, they are all listed, yeah. And PO yeah. gives the best result? Yeah, PO gives, gives the best result. Yeah. Uh, no, no, not, well, PO, within PO, uh, no, PO, of course, here is the um, benchmark one, not uh, the one R. Okay, so yeah. this is uh, yeah. benchmarking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. these are three benchmarks. 
in the, you know, well, these three basically are used uh, in some scenario because easy to configure to use, you know. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's these. Uh, that's why we call them benchmark strategies. If we go to the results. Yeah. yeah. So in the result, we our approach is the best one. That's the PGL. Okay. That's the one is PGL yeah, yeah. with the low lowest low energy, energy consumption. Energy consumption. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the worst <clears throat> alternative when when you increase the number? Yeah. 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 You know, when yeah number of uh, mobile devices increases yeah that uh, yeah PO is becomes uh, not good yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. well the reason is that you have to consider the you know wireless communication overhead kind of things mm -hmm. you uh, you uh, and uh, we uh, yeah here's another you know uh, charts to show the exact uh, results between these four approaches, PGL, FOM, FOS, and PO. Right? Again, PGL offers the best results. Is this the results based on simulation or based on experiments? Uh, based experiments? on the simulation. Simulation, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and here we compare PGL with other uh, intelligent optimizing methods. GN is very basic one. GSP means GA plus simulated annealing plus PSA. And SA based, you know, SA based PSO means simulated annealing plus PSA. By the way, simulated annealing as a kind of, uh, you know, uh, intelligent optimization method has the advantage of the kind of global search capability because they allow during their process they can go to worse solution so that you know stochastically we can prove this approach is very slow but they could potentially lead to the global optimum design so that's why sa approach is often combined with like pso because uh, in PSO, they always get the better one, better one. That, but that once you, are, you go to the local optimum, you couldn't escape. Yeah, that's the reason. So again, among these four methods, four intelligent optimizing methods, uh, the proposed one is, again, the best. <clears throat> now, convergence time, <laughs> how, how long it will, they will converge. So here, uh, convergence wise, in this particular scenario, in these particular cases, uh, GA and uh, 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 simulated and linear based uh, PSO, they have a much better convergence time, in fact. They are much faster. The reason is that they were, they, you know, they basically found the local optimum, they stopped there. They couldn't yeah. convert. Yeah, stopped there. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's obvious explained. The PGL has a takes longer time. PGL is uh, longer time, yeah. Uh, the second longest time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah GSP is the, the worst. Yeah. Yeah. So performance wise, PGL is best, but the uh, uh, time convergence time wise, it's not the best at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. This, this is the implementation kind of detail. If we really want to deploy this kind of approach, that's a scenario you are going to handle. You, you, you normally put your a controller, your centralized controller at a macro uh, base station so that it can easily dis distribute the results among all the small base stations and among them from small base station, you go to medical uh, mobile devices. So that's really the kind of for implementation detail if you want to use this kind of algorithms in reality, right? Okay, now let me come to summary. Uh, we believe for, you know, uh, partial of uh, partial computation offloading method uh, is still preferred. 
In particular, if we utilize this newly proposed uh, PGL uh, based on PSO and the genetic uh, algorithm, right? Uh, so, uh, so, you know, uh, it will be to the least uh, energy consumption uh, with a pretty good uh, result. Okay, that's my presentation and uh, welcome you to ask me any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Zhou. This is a very, I mean, in a uh, very great uh, presentations with many innovative methods to, to solve this uh, edge computing scheduling of these programs. Um, I'm very interested to uh, the comparison of this uh, heuristic uh, smart or uh, you call it intelligent optimization solution with other deterministic uh, solution methods because we have a uh, as you mentioned, we have the CPLX solver yeah. from IBM. We yeah. have like other mosaic solvers. Yeah. Uh, have you compared? We we have compared uh, for very small cases. Okay. So for for very small cases, our algorithm and CPLX can reach the same like global optimum. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, once you reach a certain number, like uh, over. Uh, 10, 20 mobile devices, uh, CPLX will fail. They couldn't produce the results within, say, a day of the computing time. I see, I see. Once the problem size, because this is the exact nature of MP hard problems, when problem size increases, they couldn't find a solution. Well, you know, in the graph, we show iterations and energy lower. Yeah. Yeah. And they all seem to get to a very low penalty pretty quickly. Yeah, because the they're... penalty isn't changing. Well, but, but, but the, the solution of it is changing because you're getting a lower consumption. Mm -hmm. you know, why why do they all put the same penalty but still uh, but why they get the solution, right? Is, well you mean uh, the, the solution because the object function contains both the normal energy consumption part and the penalty part, right? Yeah, yeah. So their goal is initially they might uh, not be able to meet the, uh, in, uh, their solution may not be good solution. In, 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 in fact, I should put it this way. Initial solution may not uh, satisfy those uh, constraints. Okay. So that's why the initial value is always huge. Okay. Yeah. You have a big number. But that it, when they pro, they proceed, you know, they immediately found, oh, I need to really satisfy these constraints first, yeah. right? Then they immediately come down. Yeah. Then they keep continuing. Yeah, yeah. The initial solution because it's random, pick it up. You can easily think, found that some those initial solutions cannot meet the constraints. Therefore, their value is huge initially. That if initial solutions are all meeting the constraint, then their value will be low, starting from low. Yeah. I'm wondering how large is the penalty, the, you know, the penalty terms in you know, objective function. Well, you normally we we pick up the that term is a, a magnitude higher mm -hmm. than the largest possible energy consumption value. In other words, let me put that away. You know, if we go way back to the uh, the equation, yeah, it's very easy to explain. Mm -hmm. So, in this equation, the small phi is the energy consumption. Energy cons consumption normally you can figure out the upper bound. So you want to pick up the infinity over n. That bigger number is at least ten times. That biggest uh, number, energy consumption number. What is this? Uh, it's a huge number, huge integer number. It's a coefficient, so you you can. Yeah, because this number is large enough. Any violation of constraints will make this number so huge. Okay. How depending on how does the solution vary depending on the initial condition? Uh, if you run the simulation and, and they are, yeah, they, they are quite, uh, uh, they, first of all, 
there's a difference, but uh, in general, they are they are they are robust. Yeah, and as well as a, so say in, because uh, you know initial value, of course, if you sometimes give very, very nice initial solution, they will faster. Definitely, that's definitely. But uh, you know, uh, on the average, the the variance is not that huge. Yeah. So it's so fast. yeah. The, the reason is that the, the, the search space is very large. If you have very small search space, then initial conditions will be even more sensitive. Uh, so in, a, in this kind of optimization problem, if you are dealing with a huge search space, then initial, initial condition doesn't uh, make much sense. Much, because it's very difficult to, to pick up the right yeah. initial solutions. If you have in, your, your search space is smaller, then you find ah, it's much easier to pick up the right uh, initial solutions. Now, by the way, this is true for most of the cases, but for some special scenarios, that's why where you know when you have some special scenarios, if you have some kind of engineering sense there, you might be able to pick up a better initial solution. One example I often cite is in the scheduling problem, in like. A, uh, permutation job shop scheduling problem, right? You can really design better initial solution. Very interesting, yeah. So it really depends on how, how the problem. How you design this uh, good initial? Uh, for solution. example, in those uh, scenarios, you sometimes you can this because they have they have give you additional information like uh, due dates, mm -hmm. release time importance mm -hmm. so you will try to say figure out uh, which two jobs are most important right they will put those two jobs start with two, those two jobs first is alternate is the number one important put number one number two put number two or first you know you, you start with those those two jobs always right then you figure out the rest of them so that this is a heuristic, not randomly choosing. You, you have one point. You must utilize some extra information to design your initial solution. So when we are writing this kind of papers, if you can introduce some such intuition into your design, your work is always will be more praise. Yeah. More information you have. Yeah, yeah more, more information you have. Use yeah, you try to utilize all the information you have to design the algorithm. That's really the message I want to pass to you. In other words, so if you write a paper, if you define this problem, right? If you can try to prove some properties first, then design your algorithm. Those kind of papers are always more welcome than you just do this formulation and start the application. They, they will think this is not 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 high, not good enough in in some people's mind. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we have recently submitted some, some papers. You know, they are really efficient, but those reviewers you know you that you are lucky. <laughs> you are lucky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you don't have more theoretical backup, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, you know, intuition is very clear. One 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 in the one of our papers. We so called uh, we use so called frequent uh, seen items. In other words, say in this kind of solution, some sequences appear in those best, relatively best solutions, right? So we want to fix those those you know sequences. At the beginning. Yeah, mm. no, not at the beginning. Ever several steps. Ever several steps. Right. So just fix it. Then. Yeah, fix it. Then you find this message is really fast. Because they, you know, somehow that's in your final global solution, most likely, right? And it is based on your observation instead yes. of based on theoretical Yes, observation. yes. But in, in, intuition-wise, it's true because you know those best, uh, you know, because they appear in those best. Uh, so far, you get, okay. So far, you obtain a solution. They are always in those best ones. You can figure out. Oh, this may be nearly a good part. We don't want to destroy it anymore, right? We keep it. That will speed up your method. Yeah. Yeah, I think this uh, 
It's kind of intuitive or like tuning the parameters yes. or fix some partial yeah. solutions. Yeah. It's, uh, if it can be based on some very rigorous uh, mathematical derivations, then to be very good scientific contribution. Yeah. However, if it is only based on experience, then yes. it's uh, simply engineering, it's yes. not the science. Yeah. 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 So some journals are, you know, some journals require some good theoretical results first. Yeah. yeah. You know, then, you know, although your performance is really, really good, but they that's, say that's not good enough. So you, now, so I advise this kind of uh, work to more target at a particular application. So I told, told them, look, if you focus on one problem from the intelligent transportation or supply chain, then you go to those intelligent transportation or supply chain oriented journals. No, they can much, they have much easier time to get your paper rather than going to like a journal of computing. That's very generic, right? Those, those people are really looking into the mathematical results. They want yeah. to prove it. Yeah, the results are more generalized and yeah. can be applied to yeah. many different applications. Yeah. 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 So if you are in the in the field for a while, you figure out uh, what kind of paper should they go to, what kind of journals with the maximum possibility to be accepted. Maximum maximize the expectation of acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I told them now because I have many students, many collaborators, I told them my current strongest you know capability is I can immediately tell this paper can be accepted by which journals. This paper will be rejected by which journals. <laughs> but sometimes they still want to say I want to try this one first. Yeah. Fine, go ahead. But uh, you know, they I know almost like uh, you know, eighty percent of the time I'm right, <laughs> very accurate on it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, on the other hand, I told my students, look, if you have good stuff in your paper, we'll definitely publish it somewhere. If I have some new contribution, there. you don't. You are not afraid of say I couldn't publish it. That's beyond your consideration. <laughs> you can. You can rely on my, you know, other guidance. Just be patient. Yeah. It takes time. Yeah. 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 I'm also wondering this um, video you played. Yeah. This company, NTT, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is your company or? That's it's... not. That's Japanese company. A Japanese very company. large company. Japanese okay. one. Uh, yeah, very famous uh, telecommunication company. Do you have some collaborations with them? I don't have collaboration with them, but I have uh, my own company in China. Mm -hmm. uh, we we are doing uh, semiconductor manufacturing. We are developing industrial software, exactly solving the issues like scheduling, fault detection, you know, big data analysis, machine learning, also entire factory simulation. So before they really and have the actual factory, we can simulate everything. So it's uh, it's 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 a uh, it's a good good company. Yeah, it's great. Where is this uh, company in uh, which city? Um, initially, it's uh, established uh, at uh, Shenzhen, Shenzhen. Next to Hong, Hong Kong. I see. Uh, just a few days ago, we decided to move to Chongqing. Uh -huh. uh, in the Chongqing is the fourth. Uh, directly supervised by central government uh, city. Uh, you know, first one is like Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin. Yeah. Now the fourth one is Chongqing, a huge city. So they go, they offer us a huge package to move from Shenzhen, the headquarters from Shenzhen to Chongqing. So you don't need to pay the tax. We don't pay tax. They give us money. In fact, they give us a lot of money. If the companies eventually go to the IPO, they will give us so much money wasted. We couldn't resist uh, not going there. Basically, our investigate. I mean, our investors want us to go there as well because they they think this is like free money from government, right? Yeah. yeah. 
because they want to develop uh, the related industry. Yeah, and see yeah. that it's uh, worthwhile because the family yeah. Yeah. will yeah. build a whole industry yeah. Yeah. with technology and a lot of talents people. Yeah. Well, in China, yeah. many fabs, you know, wafer fabs, have very low yield compared with Taiwan, Korea, USA, right? The reason is that uh, our automation software is not good enough. And the USA applied material, they prohibit such in out of you know exporting their best software. So this my company basically developing such industrial software. Really, you know, moving the level of automation a little bit higher. Any increase in yield means a lot of money in in, the, in semiconductor manufacturing. Well, a piece of wafer is cost you a lot of money. In that. So they really want uh, this uh, in the kind of companies helping them. And we have uh, basically served uh, most uh, of the fabs in China. That's why. You know, How much percent of your market share? share? My market share in the paper zero. <laughs> because I, I'm falling, falling, right? Okay. I cannot hold anything I see. by Chinese law. So what they do, they uh, basically I have one student, right? In fact, this group of uh, investors are most of my students. So I asked one of my students uh, hold some, you know, portion of my <laughs> stuff. Like uh, I think it's probably three, four percent. That's all still huge. <laughs> okay. yeah, that's good. <laughs> still huge, yeah. Like yeah. his students. Yeah, yeah, I have some very strong students. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's as a professor, that's one good thing. If you can have good students, motivate them, and someday they might uh, open a company. <laughs> yeah, and you would be very proud of their achievements. Yes. Yeah. And yes. especially they can apply yeah. what they have learned yeah, yeah, yeah. to the industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they are really doing a good job in China. So, so here in the University of Iceland, we have this um, target of this um, uh, mission for the university, a better university and a better society, mm -hmm. which I think uh, rely on all our graduate students, initiating the startups in the yeah, science part. That's here. We have a lot of startups also there. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Aiming at the global market yeah. in Iceland. Yeah, I see. The other university is a unique university here, right? We have several others. I oh, you have also. several other universities? We have the largest one. Yeah, this is the yeah. largest one. Okay. And yeah. we have another university, which is the other side of the airport. Aha. Uh -huh. It's a great university, which is a private university, and they uh -huh. are focused on they focus on engineering, their lawyers, and pretty much the, the kind of students who you don't need expensive to do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And there's another university of uh, Akori. Yeah, Akori. there are, you know, there are some very small, mm. very tiny ones. I see. Yeah. Okay. And then you have very tiny universities which kind of have maybe one or two. I see, I see. Well, yeah, uh, it's, it's a kind of strange that the research university even exists. Mm -hmm. it, it really doesn't make any sense to have two universities. But this thing, before the financial collapse, this thing started to keep rolling. Uh -huh. You had some people with time with lots of money, uh -huh. which they really didn't have. They thought they had, <laughs> and they started dumping money into this, and then we just kept on rolling. I see. Yeah. So we have two big universities. This one is yeah, let me see if we have some questions from online, online atten attendees. Okay. Um, hmm. 
Up to now, we don't have questions from the online attendees. So let's uh, give our great thanks to Professor Joe for this wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me. Yeah, Thank you. Enjoy it. Okay. Thank you. So we end this <laughs> seminar here. Thank you for your attendees. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs>